Good morning, gang. Thanks for joining me on this glorious Sunday. I know we missed last week. Today we're going to talk about um, Left Bank Bordeaux, try to stay on target. Uh, I know last week we were supposed to go over Calvados, Cognac, and Armagnac. Um, unfortunately, I left my laptop at my parents' house during the holidays, so we didn't get to do that last week. I'll try to probably circle back and, and add that one uh, to the YouTube channel when I get a chance. Uh, but in the meantime, today we're going to do Bordeaux, which I'm super excited about. Let me give everybody just another minute or two to settle in before we get started. So I know that uh, you know a few of our presentations have been uh, brief. Some of them are 15 or 20 minutes. Today's, I would say, you should prepare yourself for a solid 45 minutes to an hour. Um, Bordeaux is massive, right? There's tons of different styles of wine that are produced there. Tons of classic producers um, littered with different different laws that are absolutely critical to understand. Um, to understand the style of the wine, to understand the provenance of the wines. So we're, we're going to take a pretty deep dive today into the different um, regions of Bordeaux on the left bank, uh, the different styles that are produced, different producers. Uh, so there's going to be a ton of, of stuff, uh, in, of information on producers. Um, some of it, I mean, I guess it might be a little bit biased, uh, but we'll just talk about some preferences out of it as well. But to get started, before we before we look at a map, before we look at um, you know the major regions of the Medoc, um, I like to just talk about generic styles of Bordeaux. What is produced where, and what if you're looking at a label, can you expect from a particular wine? And so with that, uh, the authorized styles of Bordeaux sort of start with with Cote de Bordeaux and Entre du Mer, and within that you'll find. Uh, really four categories, dry red wines, dry white wines, sweet white wines, and fortified white wines. Um, within those categories, each one you'll see, I've listed the, the different labeling terms that you might find. For dry reds, you'll find Bly and Borg, Cote de, Bor uh, Cote de Bordeaux, excuse me, and Grave de Vallier. You'll notice too, some of these cross over, like Grave de Vallier, you can produce dry red, dry white, and sweet white wines, um, which is pretty interesting. Uh, for Cote de Bordeaux, you can produce dry red, dry white, and sweet white, and fortified white. So that's really the only one that crosses over all four styles. Within that, you'll also see uh, for white wines, Saint Macaire, uh, which crosses over to sweet white and fortified white. You'll see Entre du Mer. Um, <clears throat> the Grave de Vallier wines can be dry red, white, and sweet white. Pretty interesting. And then within your sweet white onlys, uh, you'll find Cadillac and Lupiac, uh, Saint Croix du Mont, and Premier Cote de Bordeaux. Um, another interesting little tidbit. So, so if you ever catch yourself in an exam setting where someone's asking you, you know, what style of wines are produced in Cadillac, what style of wines are produced in Cote de Bordeaux, you can find um, these little tidbits of information that sort of help you compartmentalize that. Uh, for the, the overall generic Bordeaux appellations, you'll find, again, uh, dry red, dry white, and sweet white, but also there's sparkling wine made under the Cremant de Bordeaux uh, AOP, and then rosé and claret can be just labeled as Bordeaux. And you'll see that along with dry red and dry white. Uh, in Graves, there's a couple of different um, um, classifications down there, of course. So dry red is made in Graves and Pesic Lanyon, along with dry white. And then of course you have your sweet white wine appellations of Barsac, Serran, Graves Superior, and Sauterne. Um, in the Medoc, you'll find dry reds produced, of course, in Oat Medoc, Leestrock Medoc, Margot, Mali and Medoc, Medoc, Poyac, San Estef, and San Julian. Um, on the right bank, uh, you'll see dry reds produced in Canon Fransac, 
Fronsac, Le Monde de Pomerol, Lusac, Saint Emilion, Montagne, Saint Emilion, Pomerol, Puisigin, Saint Emilion, Saint Emilion, Saint Emilion, Grand Cru, and Saint George, Saint Emilion. So that's just, just kind of a quick rundown of if you're in a retail setting and you're looking at a shelf filled with wines, understanding what those wines will be tasting like, what their sweetness level is, what grape varieties you might expect within them. Uh, now let's switch over to Bordeaux. Bear with me. There we go. Cool. Um, any quick questions about the styles of wine produced from the different appellations of Bordeaux, just the generic appellation? Feel free to chime in via the chat function. Uh, I should mention too, somebody asked uh, that I add some review questions at the end of the slideshow. So uh, I peppered in a handful of different review questions at the end of the slideshow. We can see if you guys are, uh, are paying close attention today. Uh, so here's a, a decent looking map of the left bank uh, here, of course, on the left side of the Gironde Estuary. Um, you can see as it gets in a little bit tighter here, um, it shows you, you know, obviously uh, the Boss Medoc, Oat Medoc, down into your Saint Estef, Boyac, Saint Julien, Margot, Graves, all the way down to the actual city of Bordeaux. Um, and then further south as you get into uh, Sarans and Barsac and places like that. Huge map. There's a lot of things to look at. Uh, we're not going to look at a ton of map work today. I think that's something uh, you may want to individually pull aside and make sure that you're familiar with uh, with maps of Bordeaux for sure. Uh, so we start off with generic history. Um, Bordeaux in general is the second largest in, uh, producer of wine to the Languedoc. Uh, it's 306,000 acres of vineyards as of 2004. It's the largest wine region as far as acreage is concerned. Uh, and the wine production near the Garonne dates back to the fourth century AD. So the Dutch, of course, uh, created the drainage channels, which are known as Jaye, uh, that have made the region so suitable for, for viticulture by draining all of those swamp areas uh, in the mid-1600s. Uh, England ruled it from 1152 to 1453, which really helped with international distribution. If you look at Bordeaux, it's obviously uh, right there on a port and capable of getting its wines out to the world on boats. Um, and so we mentioned that there. Its proximity to the Atlantic and its status as an epicenter of trade have provided its stature as a world-class wine region. Uh, Negociants began really as intermediaries. They were purchasing fruit to age in their own barrels and cellars before selling. Uh, courtiers were brokers that were supplying the chateau with the financial backing while gaining control of the actual trade of wine. I think it's important to note today that you know, a single Bordeaux um, chateau is probably worth more money than a single individual can necessarily uh, handle control of. What we're talking about is, you know, wines that are aged for sometimes decades. We're talking about futures and we're talking about producers that make 20 or 30,000 cases of, of, of wine that can sometimes sell for four figures upon release. Um, and that's why most of Bordeaux today is owned by conglomerations. Uh, unfortunately, we may be seeing some of that consolidation bleeding out into other parts of, of the wine world. You're starting to see some of it in Napa and places like that. But I think this is an important uh, place to begin when we talk about uh, large scale production of phenomenal wines um, that fetch quite, quite an interesting price. So courtiers maintain their hold and are sort of responsible for that current on-premier system, which of course is selling wine before it's produced. Um, Grobs famously predates the Madoc with uh, the name Aubryon being mentioned as early as 1521. Um, Chateau Pop Clement, excuse me, was gifted to Bordeaux in 1305 by the Papacy. Uh, the Madoc classification of course comes in in 1855 that we're also familiar with. Um, if you need help, uh, Remembering the Madoc classification, I highly recommend um, printing that out off of the Guild Song, laminating that bad boy and looking at it every chance you can. Um, the Groves classification, of course, comes down in 1953. Uh, you see that same Sauterne classification in 1855 as well. Of course, the climate in Bordeaux is known for being maritime. 
what is maritime? So it's oceanic climate, right? So typically it's in a west coast and higher middle latitudes, generally with cooler summers and cool but not cold winters with a relatively narrow temperature range, and very few extremes. This is what helps Bordeaux uh, maintain its climate and consistency. Uh, the Atlantic and of course the Gironde estuary help to defend winter freeze and spring frost. And we'll talk about a few other things that we can do to avoid those freezes um, when we get to viticultural techniques. The winters are short, uh, springs are, are somewhat damp and the summers can actually be somewhat hot. Uh, you'll see coastal pine forests that protect the Madoc from western northwestern winds and they certainly mitigate rainfall. Uh, rain of course can be an issue at harvest, especially when we're talking about later uh, ripening uh, fruit. Things like Cabernet Sauvignon and Petit Verdot can certainly be affected uh, if you have rain at harvest. And then your wet springs and humidity can cause mildew, mold, and rot, uh, which of course was the, uh, the reason for the Bordeaux mixture. We'll get to that too. Uh, great rot occurs during cooler years and certainly will destroy fruit. Um, so springtime frost, we mentioned sort of cause calor. Calor is uh, also known as shatter. And what this is, is an uneven berry set where you sort of see gaps between the fruit. Uh, it can also cause milleron dodge, which is uh, uneven ripening. And so this is hens and chicks where you'll, you'll find seedless unripe berries in between fully healthy, fully ripe berries. So two different things. I think it's important to know the difference between the two. Uh, Coulure is uneven berry set, so there will be gaps, and then Miller Rondage will be uh, small and large berries together or hens and chicks. Uh, brief mention of that Bordeaux mixture, of course, it's copper sulfate, lime, and water developed in the 1890s to help prevent fungus. Um, today, we're trying to do much less uh, usage of Bordeaux mixture. It is fairly invasive. Um, your rainfall in Bordeaux, it's at its highest in the Pesac Lagnon region at 37.2 inches per year. Uh, your average growing season temperature is 63.8 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, your aspect and geography, the Atlantic Ocean we've mentioned a couple times is to the west. Pardon me, skip past that. Uh, the Gironde Estuary, of course, the Garonne in the southwest and the Dordogne in the northeast combine. Uh, and then as far as elevation is concerned, I think it's always important to talk about this because we know that the, the Dutch came and they drained these Jaillets um, and it was swampland really prior to that. Uh, the summit in Bordeaux really sort of reaches its peak at Mouton and at Ponte Cane in Poyac at just about 100 feet, 30 meters above sea level. So it's fairly flat and rolling hills here uh, when you consider the left bank particularly. Um, soil types, now this is critical, right? So we know that uh, the wines of Bordeaux are built from their terroir and it comes from the ground up. Uh, so here are the geological deposits of the tertiary and quaternary uh, errors are sort of what has given us um, the, the styles of the wines that we have today. The tertiary give, gives, has given way to limestone and clay, which of course, um, tends to, to uh, work better with grapes that, uh, that like well-drained soil types, such as Cabernet Sauvignon, right? Clay, which of course um, works for grape varieties that enjoy a little bit more saturation, like Merlot. It's a quaternary to alluvial sandy gravels left hundreds of thousands of years ago by melted glaciers from the Massif Central and the Pyrenees. So these gra gravels are fully exposed compared to those in Southwest France. Um, and of course you see a lot more of that gravelly soil in groves. Uh, studies tend to indicate though that vine depth uh, has nothing to do with actual quality. We talk about these older vines and how they really have to stress and get down deep to get to water. But water supply tends to be the key here. Leaving the, the vine sort of thirsty um, tends to produce wines of the highest quality, so to speak. Uh, clay, uh, the clay soils tend to be a bit more prominent away from the banks of those rivers, so you get away from the, the river-driven soil types of gravel and, and limestone. Um, and so you'll see also a shift in what grape varieties are produced in the areas away from those rivers too. If you want to look a little deeper uh, at soil types by either producer or region, I think this is interesting to say, um, you'll find that Latour and Lafitte sit on more stony clay soils. You'll find that limestone soils are driven by, uh, or, or excuse me, uh, that Margot, Oprion, and Lafitte are driven by limestone soils as well. You'll see Lafitte kind of has both. 
Um, yes, it can be one and the other uh, because Lafitte has quite a bit of holdings, right? Uh, down in Barsac, you'll find more shallow limestone, uh, Sautern gravelly with some pretty heavy clay and pretty rarely limestone. And then the Madoc AOP, you'll find lower, heavier, cooler clays. And so as you get away from those uh, major subregions that we talk about in San Julian, San Estef, Poyac, um, Marco, uh, and just get to the more generic Madoc AOP, you'll find those lower soil types that are cooler and more clay driven, uh, thus being more Merlot driven. Uh, so great varieties here. Of course, there's been some new legislation. Uh, we're gonna wait until we start to see those coming online. But Cabernet Sauvignon, of course, prefers well-drained gravel, um, allows the roots to dig deep, water stress adds that concentration. Um, colder limestone and clay soils sort of delay its ripening, which as we mentioned earlier, when they ripen late and you have rain at harvest, you can lose an entire crop there. So this really, Cabernet provides the structure, the power and the longevity of the left bank blend. It's typically two thirds of the blend in the dock. Uh, Merlot is the most planted, it's earliest to ripen. And of course it prefers clay as, it's, as they help to delay its natural vigor. Merlot wants to take off. And so um, clay sort of helps to keep those vines from digging too deep and producing more and more grapes. Um, Merlot of course adds that fleshy, juicy texture. It's about three quarters of the right bank blend. Cabernet Franc excels in limestone, produces freshness, and of course provides little acidity. It adds that herbal spice, red fruit aromatics, and typically it's about a quarter of the right bank blend. Petit Verdot is really your last grape to ripen. It's added on the left bank uh, for color, for depth, perfume. It's really rarely ever seen on the right bank, uh, and it's typically only uh, added in very small amounts. In fact, as we get to a few of the, uh, the major subregions later on, you'll see there are caps on how much Petit Verdot you could put in certain regions. And then Malbec, uh, which is also known as Prusak on the right bank, is very similar to Merlot. It's actually pretty rarely seen today. And then of course, Carmenere uh, is virtually extinct. I didn't put the accent marks around Carmenere, but I think it's important to note, uh, I think with its prominence in Chile, a lot of people have started adding an Enya to it, Carmenere. Uh, which is incorrect. Um, it's the accents are on the two E's that surround it. So it's Carmen there. Interesting to say. Uh, white grapes, major white grapes uh, for Bordeaux. You'll find Semillon, Sauvignon Blanc, Muscadel uh, are your real driving factors. And then no more than 30% can be added of Uni Blanc, Merlot Blanc, and Columbard. Uh, viticultural techniques, and these have really begun to change in modern eras since the 1990s, we've seen major upgrades in ripeness of Bordeaux, uh, largely due to the, the following things, stricter pruning. Um, so they're in, inducing uh, the beginning of the life cycle of the vine uh, by pruning at certain times of the winter. Uh, higher trellising, and we mentioned earlier that frost can be an issue. You can avoid frost by trellising slightly higher for your vines, uh, getting it away from the ground and allowing a little bit more wind uh, to come through. And so what you're seeing is that on the left bank, you'll find more highly trellised vines than you would on the right bank due to the frost issues. More careful canopy management. And when I say this, instead of just letting Merlot go and go vigorous and have huge amounts of leaves everywhere, they're starting to learn that you can uh, remove leaves on one side, remove leaves that are um, sun facing to allow for more ripeness in your fruit. And then again, more cautious use of agrochemicals, getting away from that Bordeaux mixture, um, trying to st stop using as much copper sulfate as possible. <clears throat> You'll find in Bordeaux that about 90% of, uh, of the vineyards are actually machine harvest. Of course, we need to pay attention um, to the large swaths of land that are entre du mer and Madoc. There's a ton of Bordeaux that gets produced in these areas and that probably accounts for the majority of your machine harvesting. I think when you get to the top end producers, you're not seeing as much. Uh, we sort of went through styles and in Sapage Mont um, prior to looking at this presentation and I think that was important, uh, but we should also speak to it here. <clears throat> um, you can produce red wine, you can produce white wine, you can produce rosé, and then of course what we know is Clyde Red, which is very light red wine. Uh, dry whites are typically labeled as sec. Uh, we went, we discussed briefly the, the Cremant de Bordeaux earlier. It's all grapes are allowed for Blanc. There's no white for rosé production though. Nine months lees, 12 months aged, three and a half atmospheres of pressure. Probably about all you need to know for Cremant de Bordeaux. 
Uh, your Bordeaux Superior AOP has some alcohol uh, minimum requirements, and you're seeing this because they're trying to uh, ensure that they're getting away from overly sweet wines. Uh, your reds are a minimum 11% with a maximum three grams per liter of RS. Your whites have a little more leeway. They're 12% ABV, but minimum 17 grams of uh, residual sugar. Uh, vinification techniques. We know the 225 liter Burrique is utilized for both reds and whites commonly. Um, quick note on terminology that you'll hear, and I think this is an important one to note. Um, assemblage is the final blend of what's produced in the bottle. Uh, Ensapagement is the mix of grapes that are grown in a vineyard. Typically flowering and harvesting occur at different times for each grape, which provides insurance against, say, rain at harvest. So if you have a rainy harvest and you lose most of your Cabernet Sauvignon or Cabernet Franc, uh, you can lean back on the Merlot that you already picked and still produce your wine. And that's what Bordeaux was really driven by and the blend came from for many years. I know a lot of you probably work in, in retail or restaurants and you're hearing people walk in today and just say, you know, we're really into red blends. I think it's important to lead them down the path and let them understand where blending comes from and why it is that it was utilized. It was really done out of necessity many years ago. Today, we're seeing obviously, uh, I don't wanna call it a bastardization of it, but some different things, infidels and, and different grapes that are kind of thrown together for a flavor profile rather than out of the necessity of, of farming practices. <clears throat> uh, wine laws. Okay, this is where we get a little bit deep, but uh, hang, bear with me as we'll try to, try to make it as clear as we possibly can here. Um, so you have the INAO, which is the regulatory body overseeing protected appellations for wine, spirits, cheeses, and foodstuffs in France. Um, AOC in France, which is also known as AOP now, um, is the equivalent to the EU uh, function of PDO. So for these, all you have to do is have Vitis Vinifera and you can call it AOP wines. Uh, Vindapai, which is equivalent to the EU PGI, um, here's sulfur and total acidity are controlled. They have to be submitted to a tasting panel. The grapes are sourced from the stated region with a minimum of 85%. Your production may not exceed that 100 hectoliters per hectare, which is a ton. Uh, your yields for white are 90 hectoliters per hectare and red and rosé 85. Uh, they do have minimum ABVs of 9 to 10%. And here you can use either Vitis vinifera or hybrid vines. And then Vin de France, which are the table wines, they, have, they now may include vintage and variety as of 2009. Um, unlike in Burgundy uh, in Bordeaux, the term Grand Cru actually refers to an estate, not the land that the vines are grown on, or in the case of Champagne, a village where they might come from. So Grand Cru uh, particularly references the producer. Uh, Cru Artisan is another one that you might see. It was recognized in 2002 from 05 onward. It covers 44 producers of high quality uh, without large scale operations. And then the other one that you might run into is called Cru Bourgeois. Uh, it was officially recognized in 2008 after many years of confusion. Uh, 247 members must pass a tasting panel, panel, excuse me. Originally reclassified in 2003 and split into three categories. It's uh, Exceptionnels, Superiors, and Cru Bourgeois. Later, it was annulled, and now it's just a simple Cru Bourgeois label that's affixed to a member passing the tasting panel. So several chateaux, including the nine originally marked as Exceptionnels, have, uh, have, of course, withdrawn. They had the Exceptionnel removed from their labeling, and so they said, sorry, pal, we're out of here. No more from us. And then here we get into more of the major subregions that we're probably a bit more familiar with. Um, we start with the Madoc in the Northwest. Um, sort of the, the marshy area north of San Estef, you see a lot of forest and pasture and mixed agriculture, tons of drainage channels. There's actually only 123 acres of white grapes that are planted. The AOP wines uh, have to be red. Merlot's dominant, performs well in those waterlogged clay soils of the Bothmadoc, and there's a lot less oak to the wines. Uh, the Oatmadoc, which is uh, broken down in Sisak and Vertui, uh, well-drained gravelly soils, perfect for Cabernet Sauvignon. You see a lot more of croups. So these are the unearthed gravel mounds um, that are super common here. Here's a beautiful map. We looked at one earlier, but you can see we sort of start up here. Here's the Madoc, <coughs> excuse me. 
Um, and then it breaks it down. Here's Madoc up here. Uh, number two here is Oat Madoc. And then you get your small little satellites, right? San Estef, Poyac, San Julian. Here's Lee Strack and Wuli. And then down here you find Marco. And then we'll get down into Grobs, Sweet Wines, and a few others here as well. Um, San Estef, slightly warmer low due to a little bit more clay amongst the gravel. They're sturdy. They're pretty full-bodied wines. Uh, they're separated by, uh, from Poyac by the Jaillet de Brill, which I think is important to know because you will see like producers named Cote de Brill and stuff like that. Uh, Poyac, this has the deepest gravel. Uh, here you find fresh, soft fruit, oak, dryness, subtlety, substance, a lot more cigar box, vigor, and longevity. Uh, it's less subdivided than the others, thus it's more distinguishing characteristics from chateau to chateau. Here, like a whole slope or mound tends to belong to a single producer. Uh, saint julien easiest, the smallest, easily, excuse me, the smallest production. 80% uh, of it is Cru Clos. Uh, it's elegant stylistically. Here you find the Jaillet du Nord and the Chenal du Milieu, uh, round and soft when they're mature, and then they're awfully tannic in their youth, for sure. Um, and then Mouly saint Madoc, I think it's important. There's a great producer there, uh, as that's Chateau Chassis Splain that you may be familiar with. Uh, Marco, broken down into five communes, and the way that I sort of remember this, I probably should have put it on here, is clams. Cantonac, Labard, Arsac, Margo, and Susan. Clams. Pretty simple. Uh, the thinnest and sandiest gravel over limestone. The croups are typically pretty shallow. Uh, you'll find clay in outlying areas. It's uh, probably the most diverse soils in the Madoc, to be honest with you. Um, it's feminine in character. It's elegant bouquet and finesse. Uh, you find more second and third growths than anywhere else in Bordeaux, in Margot. <clears throat> and due to the close proximity and subdivision of the chateau, the differences in grape variety, technique, and tradition are more uh, important than the soil explaining for these wines. Uh, Grobs, we find sandier soils in the south, sand, gravel, light clay, uh, which is also known as Bull Ben, and I think that's important to, to recall. It allows for both red and dry white wines, uh, which is unlike the Madoc, right, where everything's red. And white's actually about 25% of the production. Uh, Pesic Lanyon in the north was delimited in 1987. Um, the communes are listed here if you want to run through those, but obviously Pesic and Lanyon are, are important. And then your major crop for Graves is actually pine trees, oddly enough. And remember, um, I, don't, I guess we haven't done Burgundy yet, but we can talk about a pine forest adjusting the temperature of a growing region by up to one to two degrees. So it can make a, a pretty big difference uh, over the course uh, of a growing season, uh, if there's pine trees close by. Uh, major subregions for dessert wines within Graves, we talked about earlier the sweet white only product producing areas of being Saran, Barsac, um, uh, Sauterne. Uh, they're made from Sauvignon Blanc, Semillon, and Muscadel, and they're affected typically by, uh, excuse me, Purature Noble, which is noble rot, right? So your minimum must weights are 221 grams and your minimum residual sugars are 45 grams per liter on these, unless otherwise specified. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so Barsac, you can actually label it as Barsac or Sauterne. Uh, Sauterne, of course, sits on the confluence of the Siron and the Garon rivers. Uh, perfect for cultivating botrytis. It's got to be picked in trees in order to ensure selection of grapes that are affected by noble rot, right? The villages here are Sauterne, Barsac, Farg, Prainyac, and Bohm. Um, in the Entre du Mer, uh, here we'll find most of the regions reds labeled as Bordeaux AOP are from this area. There's a ton of Merlot being grown in Entre du Mer. Um, Entre du Mer AOP is reserved for dry white wines. Um, limestone soils in the north are, are kind of similar actually to Saint Emilion, so you'll see that Bordeaux AOP uh, labeling for some of those. Premier Cote de Bordeaux AOP, semi-sweet white wines in the east of the Garonne. The Cadillac Cote de Bordeaux are red wines from the same area as the Premier Cote de Bordeaux. The Bly Cote de Bordeaux are uh, red and white. The Francs Cote de Bordeaux are red and white. And then of course, Cote de Bordeaux is the umbrella for cross-blending of all of those Cote de, Cote de Bordeaux. Confusing, but hopefully when we showed the, uh, the breakdown of different styles earlier, it can help you get through that a little bit easier than I think this particular, particular slideshow. Um, sweet wines for uh, Entre du Mer, you'll find Cadillac, the southernmost. The dry whites are just listed as Bordeaux AOP, and it does have the highest RS level. You see everything else is at 45, uh, and this guy sits at 51, so that might be one that stands out for you. Uh, Lupiac, 
and St. Claude du Mont. And then your major subregions of Sauterne. So um, we talked about Saron earlier, 45 grams per liter, Barsac 45, uh, Sauterne 45. Uh, one interesting note here are the differences in yield. You'll find 40 hectare liters per hectare for Saron, and then 25 for both Barsac and Sauterne. And I've added in ABVs and planting density for you as well. Um, interesting to note, Saron and Garon, of course, we talked about eight to nine different trees, um, passes, picking grapes from September through November. That can be very expensive, right? And so when we talk about Sauterne, uh, we know that the wines are expensive. And they're that reason because there are so few grapes that are actually botrytized and they have to send people back through to hand pick these things eight to nine times. Uh, low pricing makes an unprofitable business really to grow sweet wines, unfortunately. You're seeing more and more dry wines being produced from this area. And sadly, um, I think there's some master sommeliers that continue to, to stump for this, but um, <clears throat> there are certainly uh, a downturn in drinking of, selling, and uh, seeing sweet wines from around the world. And we're on the precipice of losing these great classical wines because we're not drinking enough of them. So please, next time you're at a restaurant, uh, have a glass of Sauterne with dessert. Uh, five communes make, that may call themselves Sauterne, Barsac, uh, Sauterne, Fard, Premiac, and Baum. We mentioned that. Okay, so we're through the, the styles. Let's talk about producers. <clears throat> and it's all in here. I'm gonna send you guys, of course, this PowerPoint presentation. I'm gonna let you read into it a little bit more. I don't think it's uh, necessary for me to just spout what I think about each one of these producers. I think it's all right here. But I think great producers from each region are important to know. Um, in the Madoc, uh, Chateau Potensac, which is owned by Leo Villas. Cost Gray Sac is pretty common. You see that one on some BTG list, La Tour de B. Uh, La Lande de Cos and Goulet, which is owned by uh, Cote d'Estrenel, not Robert Goulet. Um, I was confused by that. Uh, the Saint Estef, you find Cote d'Estrenel, which of course, I've listed the stars here indicate the growth. So second growth, really a super second. Uh, Montrose, Colabory, Lafon Rocher, Calon Segur, Filon and Depez, also important. Uh, you could actually find uh, Chateau de Pez with like older vintages in certain places that are fantastic for a pretty low price. Uh, I think it's important in the Haute Medoc to talk about Sociando Maillé. This is a great producer. Um, they produce quite a bit today and you can get it for a heck of a deal. Chateau Sisac and then Saint Laurent producers that are sort of west of saint julien The Tour Carnet, Camensac, Belgrave, and La Rose Trentinon. That La Rose Trenton on is another one that you'll find uh, can sort of fit into a by the glass range. Uh, in Poyac, um, Lynch Baj, which of course owns the only Michelin starred restaurant and an otherwise pretty sleepy commune. Uh, Le Tour, which is the furthest south of the Groove. Uh, it's almost in Saint Julien, furthest east, it's really close to the Gironde, excuse me, Gironde. Uh, Le Force de La Tour, it's from parcels west and northwest of the Chateau. Labeled as Poyac, but really priced with second growth. Uh, same can be said about um, Carotis de Lafitte, the second label there. But Lafitte, furthest north, almost in Saint Estef, it's the uh, smoothest and most finesse driven of the styles that come from there. Uh, Pichon Milan, which was purchased by Roterer in 2007, so you're seeing some renovations. Uh, Pichon Longville Baron, which sort of challenges first growth thanks to massive investment. Uh, Lynch Bosch, which of course for the longest time was thought of as being probably the most, uh, the best value, um, sort of coming into its own when it comes to that pricing. And then Ponte Canet, which is the only biodynamic uh, uh, chateau in the area. Uh, it's highest elevation, just above Mouton, solid reserved, and now it's of course recognized alongside those super seconds as well. Um, more producers, you'll see uh, listed through here, one of my favorites always has been Darmiac. That's an interesting story and one that you should all look into yourselves, give you a little homework. Uh, but a handful of fourth and fifth growths are extremely important. Um, Cru Bourgeois Superior, we talked about earlier, Fombade, Haute Bage, Monopoulou, and Pibron. Um, Saint Julien. Um, so these are sort of, uh, I mean, you see the second growths, these are extremely important to note. Um, sometimes they don't get as big a play as what you find in Poyac, but they age really gracefully, particularly Las Cas, uh, Leoville Poifer, 
Leoville Barton, screwed up the spelling on that. I have no idea how. Uh, and then of course, Lingola Barton too. Uh, the village of Bechevel in Saint-Julien, you will find, well, strangely enough, Bechevel. But you'll also find Brainerd du Cru, du Cru Bucayo, uh, Gerard de Ross, Talbot, Lagrange, Gloria, and Saint-Pierre. Um, the Saint-Julien Cru Bourgeois producers of note, Moulin de Rose, Chateau de Bridon, Chateau de Glana, which are both superior, and Tainac. Uh, in central Madoc, you'll find uh, Cusac, Moulas, Mouly and Madoc, excuse me, which is where uh, we mentioned that Chasse Spleen, which originally was Cru Bourgeois Exceptionnel, uh, almost as an honorary Saint Julien, uh, Peugeot, uh, and then Grand Peugeot wineries, you'll see a few listed here. Uh, Central Medoc Moor, Lee Struck Medoc, higher, uh, excuse me, Lee Struck Medoc with a higher plateau, a little more limestone under gravel. Uh, these are pretty tough and tannic wines. Uh, looking for the Chateau Forcasse wines. Clark, uh, which I've seen around a little bit, uh, and then a handful of others. More Central Medoc stuff. Citron is one that I've seen around as well. You can usually get a hold of for usually a, a pretty affordable price. Uh, as we get further south, we run into Margot. Um, and we mentioned this earlier being really perfumed and finesse style. Um, of course, we're all familiar with Chateau Margot, um, changed hands in 1978. The Pavillon Blanc, uh, which is just labeled as Bordeaux AOC, uh, sort of a bigger style of white Bordeaux. Chateau Palmer, uh, Merlot dominant left bank wine, right, for their second label. Um, Chateau Lascombe, Chateau Ferrier, Rauson Segla, Rauson Gassi. And then I've also labeled in here if they come from a different uh, commune. So Brain Cantonac, of course, is from Cantonac. Um, same with Boyd Cantonac, Puget, and Dison. You'll see Chateau de Turc from Arsac, Giscor from Lavard. And then a couple of uh, Cru Bourgeois from Margot area too. Uh, great producers of Graves. You'll see here. Serrans. It's always easy to go back to, to just say, uh, name a producer of Serrans, Chateau de Serrans. Uh, Entre du Mer, there's a handful here as well. Uh, and then from sweet wine areas, uh, I think these are always fun to know. Uh, if you're looking for traditional sweet wine from Cadillac, Chateau Fayet. Uh, from saint croix du mont you've got a handful here, including uh, Chateau Le Ram, which is one you'll probably see around a little bit more. Uh, and then a couple of Lupiac producers too. And then of course we get to Pessac and this is where we find Aubryon, right? Finesse, force, earth, fern, tobacco, caramel, um, beautiful wines. Aubryon Blanc, not classified, or is it? Uh, La Mission Aubryon. Uh, we've added, um, not only is this a first growth, but it also shows its Graves classification here too. Uh, so La Mission, um, Denser, riper, deeper than I would say Aubryon. Uh, it was purchased in 1983 by Aubryon, including Le Tour Aubryon, which is now incorporated into La Mission itself. Uh, La Ville Aubryon, which you'll see on certain things, was renamed to La Mission Aubryon Blanc in 2009. A uh, couple of other great producers, of course, Pop Clement, super far northwest area. Uh, and then from Lagnon, Martiac, Cowderjac, Gradignan, and Villeneuve. Uh, you'll find producers like Obaye, De Chevalier, uh, Carboneau, Olivier, and Fusel, who also produces the Fusel Blanc. One of my favorite white Bordeaux. <clears throat> uh, Smith Lafitte in Martiac, um, Kuhans Luton, Busco, which is a fantastic wine and a great, uh, great value typically. Producers of Sauterne, you'll find, of course, um, the only one that's the Primary Grand Cru is De Kim, fewer than a thousand bottles per acre are actually produced. Uh, superior first growth, pardon me, due to its high water table and its hilltop position. And everything else is sort of uh, peppered all around De Kim. Uh, other great producers here, Sudarat, Riasac, uh, and you'll see their different commune that they come from, which I think is pretty cool to look at. La Tour Blanche, Gilet, which of course spends decades in concrete vats, so no oak, owned by the Gonet Medvi family. Uh, some of you may be familiar, they make some sparkling wines too. 
great Barsac producers, Chateau Clemens, Doisy Dan, and Chateau Coutet. Uh, which leads me to a few practice questions for you all before we end today's session. Uh, if you were closely monitoring the presentation, you should be able to, uh, to provide answers for the following things. Um, take this with you, use it in your study groups, ask somebody what Malbec's known as on the right bank of Bordeaux, describe the difference between milieu rondage and couleur, uh, define assemblage as it pertains to winemaking. Tell us what the last grape to ripen in Bordeaux is, and name the villages of Margot. Remember that little uh, acronym that I gave you all to try and, and do so. That's my show for today. Uh, I certainly appreciate everybody showing up. Uh, we'll see you guys again next week. Um, I will be taking off two weeks from now. I'll be out of the country in Spain. Um, so I think that's January the 13th. We won't have any class, and I'll send out a note for that. Uh, but in the meantime, what I'm going to do is upload this PowerPoint presentation to, uh, to today's invite, along with the styles of Bordeaux. Um, and then I'll get this YouTube video posted as well. Cheers, everybody.